What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest number 203 on today, Friday, December 20th at block height 608,996. And we got a full house today. Janine, Rick, and Chris. What's going on, guys? Yo. Yo. Just trying to survive the holidays. It's been a lot of meetups, a lot of drinks, but that's okay. Just trying to stick with it, sticking with the news. But yeah, good to see uh, Chris back on the panel with us. Yeah, trying to start to fill things back out. I think uh going to be getting some more people coming too in a little bit. So yeah, we'll just keep building these uh, these panels back out. Mm -hmm. So, 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 ho, 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 the holidays. Oh my God. I already worn so an ugly sweater and had a few eggnogs. Is this going to be our Christmas special or what? Yeah, sure. Why not? Who's got the Christmas snow? Come on. Uh, farm yeah. to nostril. <laughs> yeah, that's not the uh, the right kind of snow. I think all the snow melted off around here. So uh, it's actually supposed to be some Christmas warm weather around here. I think I might go for one of these uh, crazy trail runs up one of these mountains or something. Yesterday I found a video that was one hour of squirrels celebrating Christmas. It was pretty good. How do you know the squirrels were celebrating Christmas? Because they were eating from a plate of nuts and they looked very happy. How does that <laughs> tell you that they're celebrating Christmas and they're because not just eating? They were wearing Santa Claus hats and they were near a tree that was decorated. How do you know that they chose to put those hats on themselves and a person didn't do it and decorate the tree for them? I'm pretty sure a person did, but they're still happy squirrels. Okay, yeah, I got nothing. Well, yeah, it's uh, the holiday season for everybody. And it uh, looks like Chris is having a little bit of trouble with his mic, but uh, I guess we can get that working. All right. So I guess that's sorted. Let's dive into it. Yeah, who's being the Grinch talking about holidays? There's like a Grinch running around Twitter. A couple of Grinches, really. So uh, what's this first one? Well, uh, a user, uh, Cat, XOL, Cat's a Coddle. I don't like why the Coddle. Uh, posted on Twitter that a withdrawal of his from Binance uh, Singapore was frozen. And... The, the letter that Binance sent to him um, informing him of this uh, directly mentioned Wasabi Wallet and his use in past withdrawals of Wasabi Wallet um, as a reason for freezing his funds and pretty much asking him what, what he was doing. Um, and then this, this blew up into a whole bunch of nonsense yesterday, but today... Um, Binance published a blog post mentioning this, um, and pretty much it's just a boilerplate. Um, you know, we are a registered business. We are operating out of a jurisdiction somewhere, and all jurisdictions have some degree of KYC AML requirements. And specifically going into how um, something like coin joining and mixing your funds to obscure the the source of them on chain could be involved in money laundering and pretty much slyly placed the blame on third-party providers that they're using um, chain analysis um, to kind of flag and monitor different activities occurring on chain and deciding whether or not these are suspicious and something should be done about them so pretty much this is is showing now that 
you know, the, the chain analytics companies that exchanges are using are starting to look at coin joins and other types of, of privacy enhancing things and starting to flag them as suspicious or something to be looked into or followed up with uh, with your customers instead of just things with clear ties to say gambling businesses that are illegal in that jurisdiction or dark net markets or so on so th they are now starting to flag just the act of of obscuring your history of attaining privacy not just a direct connection with something that is known to be illegal or criminal activity and i think that's a really big shift potentially so i think really the the core kind of open question here is is this going to start dominoing and becoming a, a normal thing that exchanges are doing in reaction to on-chain privacy tools or is this something a little more localized to to binance like maybe potentially part of the the reason for them doing this is the entire plus token scam some of which was moved through wasabi and them pretty much just trying to put on a a, a facade or security theater to to keep the government and regulators over there off their back because there are big capital flows between the wallets of Huobi and Binance and Huobi being where a lot of these these tokens or plus token coins were tracked to and so you know it's it's like what what's going on here is this pretty much just one business covering or covering their ass because of one specific situation or is this the first domino in a, in a trend of dominoes falling this has been happening for ages um Coinbase have done it, I think, since the beginning. Uh, if you withdrew money from Coinbase, Bitcoins, I mean, and you sent them to, let's say, a gambling site or something else that they deemed unsavory, then you, I think that you were asked questions. This is just part of enhanced KYC, enhanced Know Your Customer. And uh, all these financial institutions that have fiat rails, they they have there are requirements that come down to them from the government. If they don't comply, they face stiff penalties and basically makes them unprofitable in the long run for them to keep uh, denying it. So the fact that they may have had a particular algorithm looking for customers that were using uh, CoinJoin, which would be easy and trivial for them to identify, that might be unique unique uh, to this situation. But it's not the first time, and it won't be the last time that any. Uh, exchange that tries to bridge uh, the divide between a uh, fiat system and uh, cryptocurrency will be uh, acting this way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree absolutely, but I think it's a really important distinction between them acting based on, you know, concrete ties to a known illegal thing and just seeing that you're protecting your privacy with no indication of, of a connection to anything illicit or illegal at all. I, right, I think the, that's okay, a but, huge shift. Well, then you need to look into the history of uh, why these banking regulations came in in the first place. I mean, the Bank Secrecy Act, I believe, was somewhere around 1970, but then a little thing called 9-11 happened. And, you know, an accelerant was was poured onto uh, that fire, uh, which was already coming anyway. But you're now fighting an uphill battle. You're fighting against the current if you think that we are going to be having, you know, more privacy. And you start inventing things like a blockchain, which has this immutable record. And surely, you know, the, the trend being the way it is and the current flowing in this particular direction is just you're going to have fintech startups that are going to start cataloging that data and selling it um, to these financial institutions. I mean, you just I don't see any real way around that. And I'm not sure quite why this person was surprised other than perhaps it's just his first, you know, his first time of encountering it. Well, I mean, it's I think it's because of, of the fact that it was just for coin joining. I mean, you know, like I, I finally a, a while ago got rid of my Coinbase account. But when I was using that and I was still depending on the shift card, I would regularly interact with Coinbase with nothing between them and me going and coin joining stuff. But the and problem is that the, no these coin join these coin joins uh, have a risk profile for the uh, compliance officers, right? Like if you should be investing in anything, you should be investing in compliance officer shares because if someone could do an ICO for that, I mean, I'd be all in. 
Um, th th these officers spent all day uh, looking at data and analysing data and the cases, live cases, you know, criminal cases come onto the desks of police officers. The police officers call a hotline. It takes them straight through to a compliance officer, a particular financial institution, and they ask them questions about the, the metadata around these financial transactions. And if one of the things that keeps coming up time after time in all of these uh, investigations is coin join, coin join, wasabi, 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 the risk profile of that data point of you know users using some software called wasabi makes it a, a live issue it makes it it makes it very risky so in and then the algorithm learns right then those law enforcement algorithms learn and then they learn that whenever you see wasabi come up on your in one of your customer profiles well you'd better suspend the account and start inquiring and, and trying to see if you can get a human on the other end to, to give you some some explanation so in other words then this is if this starts just rolling out as a standard feature from these analytics companies and implementing everywhere, then this is something anybody using any kind of mixing tool or protocol is going to have to worry about, period. It doesn't matter, Wasabi, Join Market, Samurai, all of those can be identified as mixing protocols and which mixing protocol they are. And so this, this is just going to become a new norm in dealing with these institutions possibly. A lot, yeah, a lot of uh, these privacy advocates are in for a direct collision course, and it's only going to get worse. It's going to get a lot worse. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I yeah. mean, there's there's also, I mean, if anyone's been to Room 77, they they have a sign on the wall that says, "Don't don't send to don't send us coins from Coinbase or BitPay because we might get your account closed." Like even bu even businesses that are perfectly normal where you can spend your coins are are getting f like when people send coins to them to you know pay for a drink they're getting flagged um or they're at risk of being flagged which is like so bizarre so this these these analysis tools clearly don't work and basically what's going to happen now is i mean i think we've suspected for a long time now that exchanges would start doing this um if they weren't doing it already we thought coinbase was probably doing it for a while but basically what's going to happen is people are just going to start creating more separation between funds that they've just moved out of an exchange account into the mixing wallet um like i don't know you could do the ricochet thing with samurai and do several hops in between and sure you know Coinbase or Binance or whatever can still look several hops down, but you know at at some point if they're looking too too many hops down, then they're just going to end up suspending a whole like like they're going to end up suspending too many of their customers because at some point a lot of coins end up going through CoinJoin, um, be just because you know you may spend send it to another person they may use CoinJoin not even you. So the strategy now should just be that you increasingly put hops between the exchange address that you sent out of and sending into the mixer wallet like Wasabi or Samurai. Um, that's just what's going to happen. And, or, or at least if people create the impression that they're doing that, that's going to undermine these uh, analysis tools in terms of what they effectively flag. I don't think it it will in, in the case of Ricochet because th that's pretty much in, in the original version it's just one input one output that's obviously self transfers and even the the second implementation if you have Paynims active it's sending a, a fee to Samurai along each hop um, through their Paynim and I guarantee you that that those fees get rolled up and mixed to obscure things and so you can look at the the size of that output versus the fees samurai are charging or advertising for that and then look at that pattern and i think if if a chain in the, or analytics company really decided that they wanted to fingerprint um the ricochet transaction they could do it in a heartbeat right so uh, janine brings up a, a good point which is the the viability of a lot of these exchanges the, the business models viability in particular um they can't really make money if people keep trying to use privacy preserving tools that then drives 
you know, flies directly in the face of the trends in the financial sector, which is for increased uh, scrutiny and surveillance of uh, financial transactions. And remember what I said, it comes, a lot of the, the, the catalyst behind these regulations comes from counterterrorism. And it's, it wouldn't be the first time that uh, anti-terror legislation has challenged uh, basic freedoms and, and principles of freedom that, that people hold dear. So this is an old debate. It's, it's nothing new. And I think we should look at it in those terms rather than just look from inside of Bitcoin itself. I will also point out that um, I saw today on Twitter Rhythm Trader, who's actually one of my favorite. I, lo I love this guy. Um, and he pointed out that Russia has frozen the bank account of an opposition politician uh, just before a nationwide protest was planned to happen. And the one, one of the negative uh, side effects of the, this kind of legislation and the apparatus that you put in place in, in the banking system is that it can be weaponized. It can be used for, for the intent, for different intentions other than what was originally planned. You know, if the idea was to stop uh, terrorist financing, well, what stops the government using these kinds of laws maliciously and actually just uh, seizing the assets of people that it doesn't like in order to prevent legitimate uh, dissent? Mm -hmm. well, that's I mean, where, yeah. like th this whole story i mean whenever you look at it like I, I i agree with what you're saying like coinbase has been doing this for a long time and everything but it is getting to this point where you know recently i think it was last year donald trump himself said you don't donate to this petro address otherwise you're violating u.s sanctions and like now you know yeah a lot of this has to do with you know, funds from a plus token scam in China that is in the billions of dollars that it just seems like, I don't know how that level of scam is allowed to proliferate. Like, how does the scam get that big unless there's some sort of insiders in it and, you know, like those coins are moving and this is bringing price suppression down, which is like causing mining farms to go down. Like, I look at this whole thing, like this is geopolitics in play right now. And it's just getting to a point to where it's like just accepting coins that are coming from a uh you know an unknown source in china and like this it's just like uh that's more of what this is all about but uh like in this what there was 6102 like made a blog post like speculating that this was like binance trying to appease the chinese government by uh by censoring these transactions from wasabi or but i i don't know all i know is that it's just yeah it seems like there's a lot of big players and this is bigger than just like uh the way this was sort of background you know expect coinbase to censor some accounts or expect you know these these transactions to be censored where now it's becoming more of like a uh best practice among these exchanges because they got to follow these fatf guidelines that have been pushed down this past year and yeah it's just a, it seems a lot heavier now a lot of this, as Rick points out, a lot of this is about posturing. So many of these exchanges and, and also the financial sector uh, included, uh, they over comply with the regulations, especially when they're startups and they're running on very thin margins. They need to demonstrate and signal to governments that they are doing more than what is expected of them and what is required of them so that they can posture when they, uh, you know, do get caught and they, they perhaps weren't compliant as they and they can say, well, look, normally we're, we're doing more than what we should do. You know, we're good actors. You know, we're on the up and up. Please don't uh, come down hard on us. Uh, and, and unfortunately, again, another negative side effect that perhaps was unanticipated at the beginning is that ordinary people effectively get censored. I mean, you're using the word censored. Now, a critic would argue that the user hasn't really been censored because they did end up getting their funds released. All he had to do was uh, comply and speak with the exchange. And then once they he had done that, they were they were happy but of course it does have the effect of censoring because people feel intimidated and then they don't want to use these kinds of platforms so they look for for more extreme ways of, of getting their privacy and so as a result um yeah you you are you're hindering speech because we believe i think in in this community that money is a form of speech and we should have the the freedom to transact and if the terrorists win by taking away that important freedom among others away from us then effectively they've won yeah, and I would even say he was directly censored. Like he he was censored and, and extorted for the, like answers to these invasive questions until like the censorship was re relieved. Like it, it was your money is censored until you do what we say. Yeah.
break in fungibility. Oh, man. Like, uh, I'm glad that, you know, we got uh, some more people just working on this privacy research. I mean, this is not a, like, uh, oh, you know, we solve privacy. Like, this is a continuous fight and a battle and something that just keeps moving forward. And, you know, Wasabi was, like, bringing fungibility hardcore for a while now. And it's just, like, uh, all of a sudden this sort of stuff comes up, it, it could really uh, cause a lot of problems for all that. Not just Wasabi, but coin joins in general. Yeah, and I mean, dude, it's like privacy tools don't fix this. Like there, there is no privacy tool that can solve this problem because it's a centralized entity with control over your money deciding to fuck with you based on what it sees on chain. There is no privacy tech in the world that can fix that. There was somebody on, on the chat before we came on air who brought up uh, an important point, which is that sometimes these exchanges are just looking for excuses to increase the assets on their balance sheet. So anything that they can do to stymie or slow down the outflow of money, uh, one, I mean, it wasn't what the, this person said, but it, the, the implication being that perhaps they don't have enough assets uh, in order to be considered liquid or solvent. And so they come up with excuses to, to hold the money back in case they need to recapitalize their balance sheets. Yeah, I mean, that wouldn't shock me at all. That's like bucket shop 101 at this point in this space. It's a really good point, considering that that whole pre proof of keys movement is coming back up on the third. Mm -hmm. All right, though. I think we beat this one to death, though. Uh, you you want to take us into the next one on coin floor, uh, Rick? We got a lot of stuff yeah. to get through today. Yeah, and uh, you know, I just mentioned that uh, you you know, Shinobi put out that shy two five six episode on this subject. So if you want to hear more, go into that. But yeah, on uh, coin floor, the uh, one of the oldest exchanges out there. You know, made an, made an announcement on December 17th this past uh, Tuesday saying, quote, on Twitter, in advance of the 11th anniversary of Bitcoin, we have some big news to announce today. From 3rd January 2020, CoinFloor will be focused on providing Bitcoin-only services. And uh, then they released a blog post where they uh, made a couple of statements here. It says, uh, we are excited to announce that CoinFloor will focus on providing Bitcoin-only services from the 3rd of January on the 11th anniversary of Bitcoin's launch, the decision will allow CoinFloor to provide a richer set of services for the world's leading cryptocurrency while maintaining focus on simplicity. Part of this drive will see CoinFloor delist Ethereum, the second largest cryptocurrency from our exchange. Clients currently depositing, buying, and selling Ethereum on the platform will not be able to do so from this 3rd of January date. Ethereum custody and withdrawals will continue beyond this date, but will incur an increased administrative fee. And the uh, founder and CEO, CEO of CoinFloor, Obi Nwosu, uh, Nwosu? <laughs> says, quote, Since I first came across Bitcoin in 2011, I have seen it grow to become a mature proven currency. No other cryptocurrency currently allows, currently comes close to Bitcoin's track record, industry support, or brand recognition. So focusing on Bitcoin made perfect sense. Bitcoin is the dominant, decentralized, value-driven, and inflation-proof cryptocurrency, which gives it the potential to become the best form of money the world has ever seen. So, yeah, it looks like uh, CoinFloor, one of those uh, exchanges over there on your guys' side of the pond, Chris, like the UK, I, I've never really used them, but it looks like if you go over there after uh, the 3rd of January, they're not going to have any any more uh, shit coinery listed over there. So that'll be a good thing. And uh, yeah, I think that this, uh, you know, this just makes sense. Like uh, we've seen a lot of recently some um, some stuff going on with the Ethereum community where it's just burdensome to continue to serve that network. And, um, you know, it does take focus away from what's important. So yeah, way to go, coin floor. Bye-bye, rich statefulness. Bye-bye. Show me the daps. <laughs> Come on, not, let's let's see the daps. There's not going to be any DeFi in the UK. What's going on? Mm -hmm. I mean, CoinFloor is like one of the the bigger exchanges in the UK, but it's still like a relative to the rest of the world, a pretty small operation, right, Chris? Sorry, say that again. I was reading something. I said uh, CoinFloor is pretty much like they're pretty big in the UK, but worldwide they're still kind of small, right? Yeah, that that probably like the go-to exchange in the UK. Pretty much every trader would have an account there. Yeah. So 
I'm betting that the real logic behind this then was probably just the cost versus benefit of listing other things was just getting so stupid that it was either cut the fat or it's going to start really hurting the business. It's the walleting and the support that costs the exchanges the money. They have to manage the, the wallets. They have to download blockchain data. They have to do all of that. Um, then plus the, the support desk has to, you know, deal with all the tickets. It's just a lot easier if you only deal with one, one shitcoin or one Bitcoin. Not just that. I saw like a lot posted a tweet this past week talking about a review of hacks, exchange hacks of this past year. And most assets stolen from exchanges were not Bitcoin. It was these other assets. Of course, because they don't have the, the resources, they don't have the network effect, they don't have the security profile. It's, it makes so much sense. Mm-hmm. Way to be ahead of the curve there, coin floor. A sign of things to come, hopefully. 6102 is going to be popular. <laughs> this is a trend that I support. This is definitely a trend that I support. Don't fight the trend. All right. Well, we got nothing else to say about that. There's some uh, some other news coming out of China, some more stuff. So uh, what's going on in this uh, next bit? Yeah, this is just a, kind of a quick update to the announcement of the, the Byteway CEO, the, the former uh, lead engineer from Bitmain who started his own ASIC company who was arrested. Um now, I'm pretty much not even going to mention the, the rumor I didn't give details of that I was hearing uh, through Spider's Webs, but uh, Bloomberg has covered this. And apparently uh, what's going on is he has been arrested, um, according to Bloomberg, in Shenzhen in relation to a legal dispute with his former employer, which is not identified under request. It's a bit name. Um, and accused of embezzlement. Um, and so ge- really given the fact of how Sue happy Bitmain has been in the past over things like intellectual property that was just nonsense, like claiming things like standard circuit layouts that have been around since before they existed as a company. Um, every time former employees leave to go off on some other venture, um, I really have to, to sit here and look at this given everything going on with Bitmain and just see this as some cooked up horseshit that, that's being thrown at him legally. Because pr- pretty much the, the whole dynamic when he left was he, he was literally the, the lead engineer for their most efficient products and approached McCree, Zan, and Jihan asking for an actual stake in the company and quit when they turned him down for that. And then went off and made uh, this new company where he literally, if I'm remembering correctly, um, had a 16 or 14 nanometer ASIC chip that was as electrically efficient as Bitmain's 7 nanometer chip. Um, so this, now that there, there's some more details out here, just to me reeks of Bitmain just playing shady games to fuck with their competition in China. Yeah, I really didn't know what to think of this other than just uh, reading it going, you know, like I said last week, I don't know what is up with Bitmain other than, you know, they're still just up to their same old practices of just being pretty brutal about everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like really, like this to me just screams of desperation. If like, like let's assume that, you know, this is a made up charge like this is bullshit that the the biteway ceo did not commit any kind of laundering or embezzlement of any kind like if they fabricated something like this just to fuck with the business operations of their competitor that is desperate like very desperate oh yeah the desperation of bitmain and i don't know to to me it's just i keep seeing what else going on and uh i feel like they're bound to succeed because china wants them to succeed like there's something going on i don't know I mean, i'm being suspicious dude like i just at this point i i do not want the price to do anything but grind sideways or go down like bitmain is like China's everything everything i see looking at bitmain right now is they're at like the pivot point 
like they either reorganize their their business and pivot things in a way that can stay viable financially or they're going to crash and burn and the longer bitcoin stays down the harder that's going to be hopefully okay yeah there's some odd game theory there maybe i haven't played out right Mm -hmm. but you know that's pretty much all i have to say on that unless anybody else has some thoughts all right All right, I'll take us into another uh, just yeah another quick announcement. Really, uh, something that came up this past week again on Tuesday. Uh, Fidelity Digital Assets announced that they are going to be launching a platform in Europe. Let me uh, see here what I got written down. So, Fidel- Fidelity Investments announced that it is establishing a new entity to serve the European institution investments in digital assets. So, Coinfloor loses the shit coinery. Don't worry, Fidelity's got your back. President of the Fidelity Digital Asset, Tom Jessup, Joseph Jessup, says, quote, Since launching Fidelity Digital Assets in the U.S. over a year ago, we've seen significant interest and engagement by institutional community, which shows no signs of slowing. We are also encouraged by continued corporate and venture investment in market infrastructure companies, as well as the entry of traditional exchanges into the digital asset ecosystem. These and other market indicators, alongside interest expressed from UK and European client prospects, indicate a market with increasing potential, which gives us the confidence to expand the digital asset business geographically. So now, if you're in uh, if you're in the UK or European of European, you can invest in Fidelity Digital Assets. They have these, uh, yeah, it says they have these institutional grade custody of digital assets. They can offer trade execution and dedicated client services. So if you were over at CoinFloor and you were um, an Ethite or something or, uh, or a Meathead or whatever, you know, you might want to start registering with Fidelity because I think they're going to cover all your shit coinery needs from now on over there. Well, I think that's going to wind up being a hard lesson for Fidelity. Ah, uh, Yeah. <laughs> The amateurs take a step forward and the professionals take a step back. Well, I mean, it's not like they're wrong. I mean, there definitely is a market for all the shit coins. You know, it's, uh, I keep yeah. saying that. I'm going to just drop it. But what are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, they, uh, they got a market to serve. They're going to serve it. Yeah. But how much will it cost them when things start exploding? Well, yeah, they can uh, go to CoinFloor and ask them about that. All righty. So no thoughts. Shall we move along to some some popcorn, some laughs, funny jokes? I want popcorn. I'm missing it. Bum, bum, bum. So BSV have scheduled for February 4th, 2020, a hard fork to remove pay to script hash. Uh, Anyone who doesn't know what that is, when Bitcoin was first made, Multisig literally had every key in the multisig in the output of a transaction when you sent to it, and it was incredibly massive and incredibly expensive. So pay to script hash was created that allows you to just hash all of those keys together and the script to spend with them and just send it to the hash of that. So that's all that needs to be in the output. So Spending it is still expensive, but it's not expensive to send to it. Um, BSV is disabling this um, because that's not the original Satoshi's Bitcoin. Well, that's blowing up in their face because BitGo, um, the the multi-sig partial custody company that a lot of major exchanges use, uses pay to script hash for their multi-sig. And so obviously they are now delisting support for BSV. Um, and after February 4th, um, you can't send any more funds to the wallet um, because the fork a lot, the fork pretty much triggers to allow you to spend pay to script hash outputs, but any transaction spending to a pay to script hash address is invalid by consensus rules. And so the, the last part here, I, I love this part. I love this part is the the client action required section of their post. They they recommend two possible courses of action. The first, contact Bitco via sales at bitco.com to convert your BSV holdings to Bitcoin. The second option, 
move BSV funds to an external wallet. Gotta love the ordering of client options at the end there. Gotta love it. I mean, I think that their instruction should have just been sell for Bitcoin, don't come back, ever. <laughs> well, they, they can't do that. They're, they're a yes, they can. Legally, come on. They, they, they can't do that as a legal business doing this kind of financial stuff. But it, it's hilarious enough that they suggested sell it for Bitcoin first. <laughs> But this takes uh, Satoshi's vision closer to Satoshi's vision, right? Yes, the Satoshi's vision of no major exchange support because any exchange counting on BitGo is just probably going to delist you now. What I don't understand, like, I don't know, no one, I don't know if anyone else has brought this up before, but like, if they wanted to really go Satoshi's vision, why didn't they just take the original Bitcoin software that Satoshi first published and run that and create a network from that? Why did they like, why, why did they fork off a later version of Bitcoin and then do all of this work to undo changes since then? They should just, they should just use the original software that Satoshi created, or, you know, maybe they want to make it a bit easier than on themselves and, they would only they would only go back to the point where like the last version of the software that Satoshi worked on or contributed to. Well, they, they wanted the hash power. They wanted the network effect of Bitcoin, and that meant forking from from a later version. I mean, I believe you can still run Wait, version but, yeah. zero point eight but, but or something. I think I think there's a bigger reason, and it's see the original client let anybody spend anybody's coins because there was a bug in op return. You know, we would, but. You know, there's that whole part of Satoshi's vision. Maybe we're gonna downplay and rewrite. Yeah, that's what like th that's why this thing was a scam from the beginning because they they're trying to build this meme that they're following Satoshi's original vision, but they're not. They're like super far away from it. And the only reason that meme has been working at all is that they have this scammer pretending to be Satoshi, and now utterly failing in this lawsuit he's involved in like it's it's just a sham like they can't like e like even if we accepted the idea that the original bitcoin software as it was published was better these people aren't even doing that like i would have more respect for them if they actually tried to do that but they're not they're it's just this whole like they're scamming their own fans I'm really curious as to how popular BSV is in Australia because I've heard some rumors that it is very popular down there and they don't really like think that much about like uh, the fake Toshi Satoshi. They're like, oh yeah, this is Satoshi. But I don't know if that's actually true or not. I mean, that doesn't surprise me because they're probably just like, well, this guy's an Australian and he says he's Satoshi and that would be really cool. You know, our forests are burning and animals are dying, but let's, let's give our money and support to a guy who, yeah, who is an absolute dick. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me too much just because of their recent like legislation on, you know, the way they've been drafting things as far as trying to help surveil and, make sure that the internet is all locked down and hey you know this yeah you're right this it's a uh, whimsical aussie he says that he created it let's let him run with it mm -hmm. whole thing is just like it's fucking absurd but yeah if uh if any more thoughts on this uh or go to the next one and then i guess come right back to uh the same topic of conversation <laughs> Yeah, let's just uh, run through this one real quick because this is another one of those uh, quick news, just what's been going on in the space this past week, and then we can get back to the popcorn. So Kraken, you know, they've been making some moves recently, uh, acquiring different uh, aspects of different people. They, you know, recently acquired Pierre Richard, and they're uh, hiring strategists, and they've got an entire team. So now they've uh, recently acquired CirclePay's OTC desk, uh, Jess Jesse took to the uh, airwaves of Twitter on Tuesday again, always, and he says, uh, quote, always had massive respect for CirclePay's desk, proud to inherit such a well-regarded and successful institution. The clients will be in good hands with Kraken. Looking forward to what's next for CirclePay and Centre underscore IO on Twitter, which 
Centre is an open source project launched by founding members of Circle and Coinbase to offer USDC. So I imagine Kraken is going to be maybe falling in the USDC uh, line of things. But I mean, they've been, you know, pretty heavy and vocal in the Tether argument. So I'd be interested to see how exactly that plays out. Maybe they'll just, you know, offer USDC. I don't, I think they offer just Tether right now. But anyway, uh, this is like a, also just an interesting aspect of this is like Circle, you know, they've been shedding their business and, uh, you know, Recently, they sold Poloniex to Justin Sun and Tron to where, like, now Poloniex is just the Tron exchange. And, you know, now they've uh, sold this OTC desk. And so, yeah, it kind of makes you wonder about what exactly is going to happen with their uh, other project, you know, they acquired in the space, Seed Invest. And so uh, we'll see where uh, where they go from there. A lot of acquisitions and Kraken. And so, yeah, what do you think about Kraken acquiring that OTC desk? and USDC and all that. I think it'll be very good for Kraken, but on Circle's part, this is like, holy shit, the most stupid decision possible again, deja vu. Uh, for, for anybody who actually went and listened to that um, on the Brink podcast, uh, Nick Carter did with the former head of the, the Circle OTC desk. Um, beyond just my summary on the the part of it talking about tether um you'll know that the otc desk kind of just spun off to get bitcoins to sell to retail brokers through their um circle app which was kind of like pretty much a cash app back then and um it just exploded into a huge profitable thing making way more money than the retail brokerage was um on accident and they ended up shutting the retail brokerage down under the argument that it, it didn't make sense it wasn't making money and then like almost right after they did that the price started exploding it was like literally right before the crazy bull market, they shut down their retail on ramp. And it's like looking at this after yeah. the, the whole clusterfuck that them buying Poloniex was, it's like, oh my God, like you guys are making the exact same stupid mistake all over again at a way bigger scale because it's a fucking OTC desk. And it's just like, oh my God, what are you doing? Well, if it's anybody that can lose that, it's Circle. You know, I'm, I mean, they were acquired by Goldman Sachs, right? So it's just like they got the, uh, they got the money to burn, and uh, you know, somebody needs to learn some lessons over there, I guess, because yeah, they did shut down that retail market right before, and yeah, I, I was really pissed about that because I liked them at the time, and um, yeah, what happened with Poloniex? I mean, that's just kind of like. Oh, it's just a sad story. That was a fun troll box shitcoin exchange back in the day, but now it's just Tron. Well, I guess it's just a continuation of that story. But yeah, I mean, they got the money to lose. I mean, we'll see what goes on with that seed invest, but I guess the OTC desk just hasn't been serving them well. I mean, maybe they just haven't been taking it seriously. Maybe they acquired it all to see if they could shut down the bull run. It didn't work out. And now they're just selling stuff off. Who knows what those guys are thinking? Uh, any thoughts on circle stupidity, or do we want to get back to I'll the just, popcorn? Uh, I'll just add that, uh, yeah, Kraken doesn't offer USDC right now. It's just USDT, so um, be pretty interesting, I guess, just to see, like, because Coinbase and Kraken are competitors, but now are working with these uh, people that are using USDC. So I don't know. That's an interesting aspect to it. Okay, so this uh this is a uh, an update with the Ira Kleiman Craig Wright lawsuit. And uh, just full disclosure, I this is literally only one tiny part of this I'm talking about. Um, if you want to really dig into what's going on beyond this, um, I I have not done so. But part of the the latest thing that has been filed on Craig Wright's behalf is, is just in like 
Craig is trying to subpoena the private communications between Greg Maxwell, a Twitter handle, all members of Blockstream, members of Block or Bitcoin Core, and mining pools that predominantly mine Bitcoin because he believes that they were all involved in the compromise of Dr. Wright's electronic devices to plant all these forged documents on his devices that he accidentally turned into court without realizing they were forged. He's that has actually been submitted. That is actually something he is asking the judge in this fucking case to do. Just holy fucking shit. I cannot believe I'm I'm awake right now. I I, I really can't. This well, lawyer can wants to burn his career. <laughs> That's the only explanation that I can see is that this lawyer either is like I don't know, something is like He's either given up on being a lawyer and he never wants to work again and he's willing to let Craig just tell him what to write and put all of these crazy requests in, or the lawyer is the smart one and he somehow convinced Craig that this is all okay to file when it's clearly not. Like, no, this is, there's no way this is going through. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, like the judge has openly told him, like, you, you perjured yourself in front of me. You think this was gonna work this is the kangaroo aspect of court man they just you know you can drive a court case on forever with just oh well we want this and we need this and this is what needs to happen in discovery in order to you know well you won't allow it well blah, blah, blah. slam the gavel uh you're out of order no you're out of order but I, so, I mean, it would have been funny enough for him to just say, I want to subpoena Greg Maxwell because I think he hacked me. But he's like saying, I want to subpoena a whole bunch of people who were basically in a conspiracy <laughs> to hack me and, and yeah. forge these documents to make me look like an idiot. Like, <laughs> half, of just... the, half of the Bitcoin ecosystem conspired to hack me. <laughs> we need a RICO case here. It also presumes that Craig Wright's security is like, it's like such a big wall that you would need all of these people to hack him, which I don't think is the case. I think he could be relatively easy to compromise. You wouldn't need Greg Maxwell involved. Well, I guess the only good thing is like, maybe this is such a ridiculous request that the judge will actually throw this whole case out uh, soon. I don't think he would want to throw it out. He wants to, he's he's going to end up like, this is going to turn into like, Craig Wright's getting fined and going to jail. He doesn't want to throw the case out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, like, that'll work. That'll work too. Like, Craig, the, the last thing I read is that uh, it was the last submission by, I think it was the, the climate side, and they said in their response that after one of the one of the court appearances craig literally walked out of the court and gave an interview and he called the judge silly like this judge <laughs> is going to have like <laughs> i mean i it's probably not allowed for a judge to seek vengeance but this judge is going to seek vengeance <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah that's not such a smart move to make fun of a judge like that yeah, especially when the imaginary money you're in court over is like, what, a billion dollars, something like that? And... In Florida, no less. Oh, man. Yeah. So, yeah, that's this, this is going to be popcorn when this when this finishes popping. All right. So, Janine, I see that some meth head put his foot in his mouth. <laughs> bum 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 oh sorry for some reason my mic wasn't turning on so yeah a bunch of uh meth heads put their foots in their mouth um as far as i can see so you know how ethereum developers and stakeholders have been saying for years that they didn't do an ico at or before the launch of the network and how ether is not a security well this one guy david hoffman uh, tweeted a few days ago 
When you hold ETH, all teams, projects, and individuals building on Ethereum are working for you. You own a share of the equity, and they're helping build your product, end quote. Um, and one of the notable replies is Udi, who said, correct. That's why I recommend shorting ETH, because the team shows a complete lack of business skills, <laughs> end quote. Um, so this isn't really a story per se, but I thought it was a good intro to this section on Ethereum stuff in general, because... Uh, Ethereum 2.0 is supposedly happening, and I've heard from more than one person uh, since DevCon this year that their spidey senses are tingling and they think that Ethereum 2.0, or whatever they're calling that, uh, is basically going to turn into an exit scam. Um, that's just the impression that they were getting. And these weren't Bitcoin maximalists saying this, these were people in the Ethereum space and people who've even been involved in doing token sales and such. So, you know, if their spidey sensors are tingling, uh, something is probably not going right. Um, and as I've said on the show before, the main justification for creating foundations like the Ethereum and Zcash foundations is that they make it easier, easier supposedly to raise and organize funding for development, but over the years we've seen a number of contradictions in that supposed ideal. You had the major uh, wallet maintainer in the Zcash community threatening to fork their network because he was not awarded a grant that year to be compensated for his work. Why a lead maintainer should have to apply for grants every year to get funding is a mystery uh, that continues to this day. Um, and this problem has recently surfaced again in the Ethereum space because on December 16th, Parity published a blog post that says they are, quote, transitioning to a DAO ownership and maintainer model. Uh, in the blog post, they write, when Parity Technologies began back in 2015, it was an overwhelmingly Ethereum-focused development shop. Over time, as we grew, we took an increasingly more token agnostic view, starting with BTC and ETC support in 2016, then um, Zcash in 2017 to 2018. Substrate, our next generation blockchain, blah, 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 token, blah, blah, blah. Not going to read that. Basically, token agnosticism uh, for the win, something like that. Uh, continued, uh, as Parity's outlook changed, so have the practicalities. Supporting a large, com highly complex, and now quite old code base. It's, it's not quite old. <laughs> Guys, come on. It, this is not old stuff. This is like three years. <laughs> come on. Like, hold your horses. Um, on a quite old code base, uh, code base um, on a mainnet is well used and with such decentralized decision making as uh, as Ethereum. I, I don't really agree with that. But uh, is a very much... Uh, is uh, a very much non-trivial task, even for experts. We spend an unfortunately large amount of time on relatively mundane maintenance work. Ah, uh, God, there, there's like so many places in this post that I just want to insert my sarcasm because it's like, well, if you had done more maintenance, maintenance work, maybe the, you know, parody multi-sig thing wouldn't have happened. And anyway, I'll, I'll try to stop. Um, that could be uh, better done by others in the community if only we had the correct structure set up. Indeed, Parity is increasingly unable to dedicate the level of resources required for even a simple maintenance of this project. Um, in addition, they say, over the, next, or over the coming weeks, we will discuss the DAO with key stakeholders, including the Ethereum Foundation, ETC Labs, Gnosis, uh, POA Network, not sure what that is, and other contributors. I think that might have been the polka dot thing. I can't remember. No. Yeah. Anyway, so... Um, Note there that they list the Ethereum Foundation, which, if you may recall, um, Gavin, who is part of Parity, is a founding person in Ethereum. I don't know if he's still at the Ther Ethereum Foundation, um, but the Ethereum Foundation has basically, like, that's been their primary, primary funder for as long as I can remember. Um, and you may recall that the Ethereum Foundation is flush with cash because they've sold millions of dollars worth of Ether recently. Please. So why is the Ethereum Foundation not giving them money for development? Is Parity moving too far away from Ethereum-related work? And they think that giving money to a group that is building Ethereum-like competitors uh, a bit weird? Maybe there was too much bad PR that hasn't been made up for from the multi-sig lockup. Um, but according to Hudson Jameson, 
Uh, the Ethereum Foundation literally gave them a grant that they have partially paid out. Parity is declining the remainder of the grant to focus on other technologies other than Ethereum. This is less of a funding issue than you think. Uh, regardless, um, I don't know how many people saw that, but people were asking on Twitter, why can't you just pay AFRI or why can't we just pay AFRI, like get a community fundraiser together? Because even though AFRI Shodan has been uh, quiet in the last year, see Block Digest episode number 158 for the backstory there, he's still been working at Parity. And uh, Jutta Steiner, who is the founder and CEO of Parity, responded, you might want to add some developers to the mix who can actually write the code. Otherwise, at least towards us at Parity, Afri in the end wasn't interested in taking this forward, which is really unfortunate. One second. Um, so justifiably, uh, after that comment from Utah, I think uh, Afri seemed a bit pissed off. And so he said, right, I'm not a developer. I'm a software engineer with two university degrees in applied computer sciences. Sometimes engineering is more than writing code. Uh, but why do I have to defend my reputation on Twitter? Uh, furthermore, he tweeted in a long thread, if you had listened once to my advice, you would have never gone through such a public relations nightmare putting the client in a DAO right after receiving uh, funding from the Ethereum Foundation. My conditions for spinning out the Parity Ethereum client were um, having its own legal entity, brand and license rights, substantial seed funding, he writes like 750,000 euros, um, minimal governance with no DAO, and two committed Parity engineers. Is that unreasonable? You rejected uh, that, telling me that I would have to seek funding from the Ethereum Foundation after all you got in terms of the grant. Um, continued, meanwhile, you threatened me to stop publishing on social media. I respected that and didn't post until now. Regardless, you terminated my contract with immediate effect and without any further reasoning. As if that's not enough, you messaged my friends privately, telling them I have mental issues. I'm a single dad with two kids now, having no income, no social security, and no health insurance since yesterday. If I have issues, then it's your lack of support." End quote. And so this was all said a few days ago. Um, Afri tweeted again yesterday to say that he apologized for his quote overreaction. I don't know if that was he he genuinely believed it was an overreaction or if that's what people have been telling him. But he said we had many differences in the end, unfortunately, but that should not prevent us from acting professionally. I was emotionally attached to the Ethereum client and very sad about the announcement. Let's move on and hope someone will take care of the code base in the future. And then you to reply, thank you for all your care and contributions over the years. Afri Parity Theorem wouldn't be what it was without you. Wishing you all the best. Um, so I don't know what happened in the two-ish days between Afri's uh, criticism and this apparent uh, resolution. I don't know. But yeah... There's something seriously going wrong because if if you if you don't remember, originally Afri was the one in the Ethereum space who was doing a lot of the node maintenance and he was doing like uh, checkups on that and um, he was also one of the people that I remember who was really criticizing the fact that Ethereum was uh, becoming more centralized over time and this was over this was I think a almost a year ago I think it was like 10 months ago and yeah so he left because at one point he said you know uh wh why is ethereum substantially better than the polka dot network proved me wrong and instead of you know ignoring him because you know under normal circumstances <laughs> ethereum should be better than polka dot but apparently that hit a nerve and everyone in Ethereum got really, or a lot of people got really mad at him and basically kicked him out. So the fact that he's now been kicked out of parody as well, it's like, what, what is going on? Like something is going wrong here. And this, this whole thing about, you know, we need foundations to fund development. It's like, that's just getting more and more holes in it. It's almost like all that money they raised really wasn't for supporting these projects and it was for lining their pockets. Show me the daps. 
should somebody, for the love of God, just show me what this fucking thing is good for? Because otherwise it just looks well, like a bunch of fucking people with too much money, circle jerking. What has Ethereum ever done for anyone outside of its own community? Well, so I just want to point out, I can't remember exactly, I can go and look for it. Um, I can't remember exactly which episode it was, but there was a time where I read a survey that was like counting dApps and the infrastructure that they used. And the way they defined dApp was just an application that was, it was something like an application using a blockchain, which like that's a really bad definition a dap is supposed to be a decentralized application like it's not just something that uses a blockchain because there's lots of things that use blockchains or use blockchain data that aren't decentralized so yeah i did if that's their definition of daps then they've already lost Oh, yeah. This is like we're in a new uh, hype cycle coming up. It's no longer blockchain all the things. It's decentralized all the things. Like I've got an interesting, you know, uh, pers like whatever story about this whole subject matter. Like just a couple of days ago, you guys know I'm in Ethereum Hub Central over here. There was a holiday ugly sweater party at uh, one of these co-working spaces where it was a like, – well, I, I mean uh, – but Austin Griffith from the Burner Wallet was there, Kevin Iwaki of the Gitcoin, uh, Piper, uh, I don't know this guy's last name, but he was giving a talk on um, his new wallet, Trinity, and the uh, Python fast sync capabilities to scale Ethereum. And he kept saying, you know, Ethereum.0, Ethereum.2.0, what was 1.0? And it, yeah, it was all really confusing. And I really did want to ask about parity. There was a lot of people asking a bunch of questions, and so I just sort of looked over at the person next to me, and I was like, are you a fan of Ethereum? And they were like, well, I'm in the Ethereum Foundation, so yeah, I'm a fan of Ethereum. And I said, oh, really? Well, let me ask you, what's the deal with this parity client? Is that thing bit the dust, or is like this DAO development model actually going to work? And they told me to ask the group, and it you know, spurred this discussion. And if you could tell like everybody was a little just... I guess didn't really like the idea of polka dot and uh, what exactly parity was trying to do and that scaling roadmap for Ethereum. And it was just, uh, I really wanted to ask the follow-up question. It's like, how is it that you can't be in the same position a couple of years from now where it's like all of this development that you've got going is being funded by this foundation that just took away the funding from this person that's been working a long time on Ethereum because I guess of a difference of opinion on the way that this thing should scale. And yeah, I, I really just, I think this is one of those things where you, you take these aspects of like what's going on with parity, but also what happened with their recent hard fork and not implementing the glacier are kicking the can down the road of this glacier mining where, you know, it's supposed to slow down, the mining to try and implement proof of stake from way back in the day. It's like all these things and the hacks and the insecurity. It's just like so much stuff that adds up to where, yeah, this is a crazy asset that just doesn't make any sense to really try. It doesn't have any sort of, it doesn't have any staying power. It just looks like it's constantly ready to be either 51% attacked or like somebody's going to dump a bunch of, you know, uh, these, uh, these pre-mined coins that they bought in a pre-sale or, you know, whatever the scaling solution is they're working on right now, all the funding is going to get pulled from it. it. There's just so many ways that this thing is going to get screwed. It just can't. I mean, it's only five years old, but I don't see it lasting another five years. I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is why I'm so against these types of foundations in Bitcoin is like, look what the fuck they're doing. Like, that's where all the money goes because people just put the money there because they give it to the foundation and they fund stuff. And then the foundation has total control over what gets money or not. And like, Jesus, like this is the, one of the main protocol implementations. And funding's getting pulled. You're just going to fart a magic DAO out of your ass? How'd the last one go? Yeah, and I just want to point out, um, they, they mentioned in the blog post that the DAO is going to be using proof of stake, obviously, because, you know, they they've... <laughs> tried that one before um what was the other thing uh, yeah yeah 
And, and you know, should, should we just kind of like slide into the next one? It's kind of really related anyway. But um, the 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 whole fork that they just went through that dropped off like half of the nodes on the network. That there was a whole clusterfuck to deal with. Oh, they yeah, got to do a new one. They have to do a new one. Like literally in, in, in a week or two, they have to do a whole nother hard fork. Because after this last one, they realized, whoopsies, the difficulty bomb that keeps slowing down blocks to push everybody into proof of stake is fucking ticking up again. And they completely forgot about it. So now, two weeks after a major hard fork that dropped half the nodes off the network, and, you know, it's it's just timing you know all these other projects and in trouble and people dropping out of the space around the same time and businesses delisting but i i think they're very related and now they have to do another one otherwise the the block times just keep slowing down and fees keep going up it's just you forgot that you forgot the the major thing that disrupts the whole network and affects the inflation schedule um was going to do this and, and didn't put it in the last hard fork you just did? Really? Yeah, this was the thing that I was really laughing at at first with all this, where I I wanted to go in there and ask them about this, but the parody thing happened just like right after. It's like I wanted to ask about that too. It's, there's a lot of craziness going on there. But yeah, it was the Ice Age mining. I guess that's what I was saying Glacier because I'm thinking of the Glacier Protocol. But yeah, this Ice Age mining protocol where it was to try and force their hand to move towards proof of stake. And... That's just kind of completely been nixed out of the roadmap, but they don't really know what to do other than to keep kicking this can down the road, and they forgot to do that. And it's just like, yeah, you could grind the chain to a halt, and you're, you know, yeah, it could definitely affect the inflation rate. And I mean, what's the deal? Sound monetary policy? Nope. Do you have any, uh, any really good multisig? Nope. Do you have a good working client? Nope. Not really. Okay. What's going on over here? <laughs> yeah, where's the money going? I think oh, and, um, some some nice uh, North London properties were purchased from the Ethereum uh, yeah. original ICO, and, and also I believe some Ber- uh, some Berlin properties have also been purchased. Multiple properties per Ethereum, you know, uh, rich list kid. And oh, lots yeah. of drugs. <laughs> oh yeah, let's not forget about the drug consumption. I mean, come on. So you know, people are doing well. It's going back into the economy. Drugs. It's putting it's putting drug dealers in in business, and and you know, drug dealers are people too. Dude, come on! If you raise money, you're you're gonna buy some drugs. Come on. It's the hookers and blow, right? <laughs> it is. <laughs> oh, it is so crazy how things are changing over there. Like, uh, God, like two years ago, I was talking. Bitcoin and everything with these guys and they were just looking at me and they were sort of, I could almost feel like their disdain for me where they were like, they were seeing like, they didn't want to deal with the fact that money is a problem and banking is a problem. They just wanted to build innovative shit. Leave us alone with your, with your, you know, your rhetoric about all these problems and that we need to solve these problems. And now it's like two years later, they're like doing these presentations where it's like, well, Ethereum is money and crypto is money and like we're building our own little communities and like we do whatever we want what we want. It's like, man, these guys they just uh they don't know what they're doing. They're just trying to stay alive and stay ahead of the regulators on all this stuff. Cause yeah, somebody's buying up a bunch of property and moving some money around to make sure that, you know, they're not gonna get totally screwed whenever the whole network does grind to a halt and everybody kind of makes the realization that this thing's gonna go down. I I don't know when it's gonna happen, but I'd still like there's still some moment of reckoning where this like number two network that's been long running for a long time all of a sudden just really shits the bed and just just not disappears entirely but it's no longer even in the top 10 and people just say like oh well you remember what happened with ethereum mm-hmm. all right so uh i think that was that was enough beating can we move on? It's never uh, enough beating. It's never enough beating, but we can move on. <laughs> there's there's one more thing. I I can't remember who said it, but I saw someone in Ethereum saying like 2019 was the year that Bitcoin got rid of the maximalists. I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking? About? It's like if anything, I've seen more people call themselves maximalists this year than before. So it's like I don't know what these people are smoking, but. It's clearly getting bad. 
Yeah, I saw that tweet too. So come on. Mm-hmm. Alrighty, but next up, I have made a realization. So the saying goes, cypherpunks write code. I found a shortcut. Yell at someone else until they write code. So the new version of the cold card firmware uh, 3.0.6 is out. And I finally have a feature that I've been yelling at Rodolfo for a long time for. You can sign a text file that is one line uh, on the micro SD card. So you can now sign arbitrary messages uh, to prove coin ownership, uh, sign messages with a ad hoc identity, whatever the hell you want. Fucking awesome. And as well, um, you can now see all change outputs uh, when signing a transaction. Um, some bugs were fixed in the address explorer and you can now have a PSBT file dumped in base 64 or hexadecimal format. So awesome all around upgrades. And I finally got the thing I've been yelling for. Woo. I've never plugged my cold card into a computer and I never will. I still need one of those things. Come on. All right. So I guess, uh, shilling done. Uh, we move along to some, some other shilling. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, so C-Lightning 0.8.0 has dropped, and there are some pretty awesome stuffs in here. So this is the first C-Lightning client that will default run to uh, mainnet upon launch. And they've also tweaked a few things uh, with their data directory to maintain um, different data directories depending on the network you're using. Um, so that's something to be aware of if you flip back and forth. Um, and as well, um, AMP is, is here. Um, it's only C Lightning support on a mainnet version. And um, they did some testing with async but I'm not sure if AMP is officially in a main release of Eclair yet. But um, it's now at least uh, definitively in one Lightning client possible to make atomic multi-part payments where you split the payment out between multiple different channels of yours and have them recombine at some point uh, to the end. So this is a huge liquidity improvement for the network as you're no longer limited by the, the smallest single channel in the route of a payment in terms of being able to, to make a payment. And as well, um, they've done a lot more um, tinkering with the hooks uh, set up for their plugin system. And so they've, they've pretty much started taking um, commands and breaking them down more modularly. So um, let's say the, the HTLC um, stuff and then some of the, the onion routing stuff, like uh, the send pay function has been broken down into uh, create onion and send onion. So it's kind of breaking down exactly how modularly plugins can, can grab things. Um, so instead of now having to go through and just call to send a whole payment, you can make a plugin that handles creating and sending things independently and you know that's you know i i keep rambling about how awesome the plugin architecture is and one day um people will finally start building crazy things with it but yeah Woo! so guys when am i going to be allowed to like put a block stream story as the first story again so i can get paid because uh, I'm, I'm really strapped for cash lately I was surprised to not see Blockstream as the first story talking about those uh, STOs coming up. Well, I think we uh, we touched on those, actually, uh, while you were on hiatus. Oh, uh, okay. Well, there it is. Well, then put the no notice on uh, Blockstream. We need some more headlines. Mm-hmm. All right. So, no, no, no more thoughts? Shuttle along? All right. Really cool tool I uh, dropped from BitMEX Research. Um, so this was created in response to the four Bitcoin that were lost in a hard drive failure um, on the Lightning Network that, that 
weren't actually lost. Um, and then we found out later were actually uh, recovered and none of them were actually penalized on chain um, with a penalty transaction. So BitMEX Research has set up a monitor um, to scan the chain and show every um, Lightning Network penalty transaction that hits the chain. Um, and so this is, I think, a really awesome thing just in terms of having publicly accessible data. Because, I mean, you know, in reality, the whole chain is right there public for anybody who wants to tinker with it. But also in reality, it's not that simple for less technical users. And so it's tools like these that really fill in that gap. And even one of the features on this um, shows um, the penalty transaction chart next to the actual fee rate. Um, they, they were kind of looking to see if there was any kind of correlation there. And honestly, um, you know, this is just me kind of thinking to myself, I see the potential for things like this to maybe even fulfill some kind of watchtower functionality if wallets were able to export the necessary information um, for users to be able to to pull and put somewhere else um you know maybe people could come check a service like this manually themselves as long as they're taking proper precautions with what data they're giving them in which circumstances and their network privacy you know, maybe this could be one of the many ways that watchtowers get implemented. But, you know, anyway, it's a nice thing. And never again will we have to sit here and wonder whether someone claiming they lost money on Lightning was lying or not. Uh, we can just go look it up on this tool. Heck yeah, looking at it, it looks like there's only been one theft so far this month. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and I do... I did forget. Uh, well, one thing to keep in mind with this thing is that it's very possible for this to be gamed. Like if, if you were to spin up two lightning nodes and make a channel between them and then just steal air quote because you're on both sides, uh, you, you could create uh, penalty transactions that were not actual instances of theft. But you know, it, it's still nice to have this data there for everybody to look at. Right on. So is Shinobi just motor mouthing through to the next one? Or are there thoughts here? The oh. only thought is it's good to see Lightning Network development continue. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so I guess we'll just slide along. Uh, some really cool beginnings of something uh, coming out of Shirt Bits. Um, they are beginning work on creating a specification for discrete log contracts. Um, if you guys watched the special edition uh, we did with Nadav Cohen from Shared Bits a while back, uh, we got a lot into the, the lightning stuff they're working on in DLCs um, as a way to kind of have a, a smart contract conditional on something with an Oracle is one of the things we talked about. And they've started now working on f at least what they have so far in the specification and work is care or, excuse me key derivation um, specifications. So how to handle um, the hardening of subpaths and derivation of keys specifically for a single uh, discrete log contract. And pretty much um, the different types of keys you would need, um, the, the funding key for the multi-sig, the keys for refunds, and then all of the keys involved in every possible outcome of that contract um, necessary to settle it. And then also um, a specification for the transaction structures that would be involved in this to guarantee that change is sent um, from the funding to the proper places, all of the, the refund addresses are correct, and that each of the possible contract execution transactions are all structured correctly. And I think this is going to be a really awesome thing going forward because this is a, a general smart contract that can be really used to build all kinds of conditional payments um, with oracles and in the long term there's even some possible 
you know, crypto magic that could go on here in terms of um, with Schnorr combining keys from multiple oracles so that there is not any one single oracle to collude with uh, regarding the execution of the contract. Um, and so there, there's going to be the same kind of security concerns to walk through with that um, as there were with some of the multi-sig uh, stuff with Schnorr before that, I think, really gets to anything approaching a finalized state. But, you know, this is pretty fucking awesome to see. And you know, it, it still boggles my mind, like, all the, the stuff... Uh, about Lightning Network being bandwagoned all over the place. Like, I never see anybody talking about shirt bits or what they're doing, except when I go, like, look and, and see what the hell they've been up to. It, it boggles my mind. Yeah, it's good to see that, uh, you know, this this repo is getting created and this uh, discrete log contracts are coming out because Nadav has been talking to me about these for a while, and I know shirt bits has been, you know, using this and they're uh, and they're set up and they've been looking at how exactly to get this uh out there to the masses and so yeah it's awesome to see that uh yeah this is created we need more people's eyes on this and more people's eyes on short bits and what all's going on there cuz these guys are moving forward with lightning uh whichever direction uh lightning's going they're they're going uh they're doing their own thing and they're they're also doing their own thing with bitcoin and you know they're really smart guys over there so yeah Maybe uh, somebody can take a look that knows a lot about coding. They can see in the show notes there's a GitHub repository. Go check this stuff out with all these uh, key derivations for DLCs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's it really something like like people should get widely involved in because you know it's this is a just a general construct in Bitcoin. Like if if you want to have a payment that's conditional on anything happening outside of of the Bitcoin blockchain, like you need something like this. And like this can be done on chain, this can be done on the Lightning network. Like this is a general smart contract structure. And like I'm going to be really disappointed if while I'm watching how this develops, like I just keep seeing like people not pay attention to them because like this is a really important thing long term. Yeah, it's important. Like, uh, like we're saying, go check it out. We need more eyes on this, we need more hands on it too. I think we need to formalize a section where I just rant through a bunch of things really quick one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. I think we got some, uh, some roadmap work there for that. We can add that to the whole orphan block thing, maybe. Mm -hmm. Spoilers. But um, yeah, I think uh, you're up, Janine. I think this is some good news, isn't it? Um, I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily good news. Um, it's just kind of funny. Uh, this was something I actually wanted to talk about in the previous episode, but I forgot to add it to the news desk. Um, so this is a little bit late, but maybe people haven't noticed it. Uh, so way back, uh, for background, way back for episode number 87, we talked about Keybase partnering with the Stellar Foundation to integrate cryptocurrency-related features with their encrypted chat app. And then in episode 190, we talked about how uh, once that wallet was up and running, users were not able to disable that Stellar wallet once they had accepted any of the airdrops and that their Stellar addresses that the funds were then sent to, which uh, when I briefly looked at the really annoying spam DM message, um, I think it was offering me like 40, it was somewhere between 20 and $40 worth of Stellar. Um, uh, tip, pro tip, uh, if you want to not be receiving those messages anymore, you can block that Stellar airdrop account, um, which I did. Uh, so that was annoying. Um, but then recently, on December 10th, they posted, uh, uh, Keybase posted an update saying, this month will be our last for the Stellar Space Drop. Um, on the week starting December 15th, we will distribute the final 100 million lumens among all qualifying members. The total giveaway amount will have, uh, will have been 300 million lumens, approximately $16 million USD worth. Um, while this giveaway mostly worked, it's clear that there will be decreasing returns and massively increased effort required. Why? Starting in the last week or so, hordes of fake people were beginning to come in, far beyond the capacity of Keybase or um, 
SDF, which I think is the Stellar Foundation uh, thing, uh, to filter. It's not in the Stellar Network's interest to reward these people. It's also not in Keybase's interest to have them as Keybase users. As we've said from the beginning, SDF reserves the right to give uh, to end this giveaway early. The last month will go out, of course. If you are a legit registered user, expect your share of 100 million, 100 million lumens next week. Now, this is the reason this is particularly funny to me is because they are complaining about quote hordes of fake people coming in. Um, yeah, so the thing that Keybase has been pioneering since they launched is this feature where you can add like ownership of various web assets. Um, I mean, I don't know if they call them that, but that's functionally what they are, where you can basically post a signature um, on a website on your, through your GitHub account on one of the, um, you can like post notes and put it in there. Uh, or you can do it via a tweet for your Twitter account, basically various, various web assets. You can add a signature to it that basically says, um, the person who controls the key on this key base account, uh, is claiming to own these things and they've proven it by posting the signature. Um, so when it comes to Sybil attacks, um, that should be relatively easy to figure out because you would think that, you know, the, the people who have registered various assets, like especially things where they have a large following, like on tw for Twitter accounts or GitHub accounts or something like that, it should be really relatively easy to tell whether an account is fake. Now, of course, there probably are key base users that don't register any assets and they just use it as an encrypted chat app and they don't care about the reputation stuff. But again, if they wanted to be completely sure that they weren't, you know, that they weren't having this issue of fake accounts popping up, they should just be looking for, you know, which members have at least verified, you know, let's say two web assets or something they've they've proven that they own these things like they could have put various stipulations in place so that the airdrops were only going to people that had actually you know shown some degree of reputation elsewhere outside of keybase i don't know why they didn't do this it would have like it it would have been a no-brainer for if i was at keybase that that would have been a no-brainer decision to prevent this kind of thing i don't know if they tried that but it sounds like they didn't. <laughs> so uh, then I'm going to, this is actually an archive of the post and they've since updated it. I'm gonna quickly go to the new version. How dare you leave dead air making sure you have up-to-date information. Yeah, so um, on, I think this was the 13th, December 13th, they say, we've begun distributing the final 100 lumens among qualifying members. I, again, they don't describe how, what is a qualifying member? Maybe they did smarten up about that and maybe figure out, oh, we should actually use our own reputation features to like figure out who should get these annoying tokens. Um, they say the total giveaway amount will have been 300 million lumens, blah, blah, blah. This morning we disqualified about 100,000 garbage accounts. The lumens will be divided equally among uh, 282,000 mostly real and living or at least undead human people. Wow, that is... I'm reading that part, that paragraph for the first time. That is the weirdest thing I've ever read. 100,000 garbage accounts, and they don't they don't say how they determined them to be garbage accounts. They basically say they took... that. That's the other thing. They basically admit that they were able to... Uh, it's It's unclear whether they said that they took the the stellar lumens back from these accounts or they just mean that the funds that were going to be distributed to these accounts were like realigned to go to different people like they hadn't been distributed yet not very clear but this is like the such a weird paragraph 282,000 mostly real and living or at least undead human people wow that is a weird line while this giveaway worked for a while, it's clear that there are decreasing returns and massively increased effort required. 
Um, and they basically repeat what they said in the previous post, but they reword it a bit and it's even funnier. They say, starting in the last week or so, crappy fake accounts were beginning to come in far beyond the capacity of Keybase or SDF to filter. It's not in the Stellar Network's interest to reward those people, blah, blah, blah. Uh, as we said from the beginning, SDF reserves the right to end this giveaway early. The last month is going out. It's all It'll all be done within a week. Um, thanks, everyone, for the laughs and screams. And then they put a knife emoji. <laughs> so, yeah, this this is a pretty hilarious end to a really shitty campaign um, that I... I hope someday Keybase will learn to regret because seriously, there were so many things wrong with this. Like just the fact that you had an account, a random account DMing people, like a new account DMing people saying, I have money. Here's how you get it. Like that, that was such a breach of all of the effort that people have put in over the last two years to stop idiots from clicking on messages like that and either having their devices compromised or getting into these stupid schemes where they send Ether or Bitcoin to X address and then it all gets taken because they they were like, oh, you'll get 2X the returns. Well, like it was such a breach of like the principles and the effort that people put up to prevent people losing money and yeah, this, like, I'm glad that it ended early, but I don't think that they've learned their lesson yet. It just sounds like they kind of got annoyed that there was fake accounts, but they should have expected that to happen. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yep, could have told you this was going to happen. I mean, it's, like, really, like, why on earth would social media platforms that just have civil problems as it is create a financial incentive for people to civil? It's like, what what are you thinking? It was like right after they launched that Lumen Stellar drop, like Keybase just became scammer central. It's all of a sudden, I even had a fake scammer on Keybase. It's like everybody had a fake guy on Keybase. Yeah, I had I had never had fake accounts following me or trying to talk to me or anything like that. And as soon as this stupid airdrop thing started, I was getting fake accounts adding me to like group chats. I was getting fake people following me, messaging me, and it's just, it was just so annoying. And that was not happening before this airdrop. But clearly it shows that whatever... I mean, it, the lucky thing is the reason I could tell they were fake is because I saw that they, they, the name didn't look quite real. The picture looked like it was just taken from Google Images or something, and they had barely any reputation assets, if any at all. So the reputation system worked, works at a human level that I can look at it and see it's probably a fake person, but apparently it doesn't work when you're randomly distributing tokens to people. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Like they do have this system all in place to make sure that you are who you are. And yet they still just drop these things to a bunch of, uh, you know, rando bots. And yeah, geez, I, I'm glad that you said that you could mute that. Uh, I didn't even think about that. You could block that account. I'm going to do that because I did keep getting like reminders like, hey, here comes the next drop. It's like, geez, this thing. Yeah, I don't want shit coins. Give me Bitcoin. Ping me when you're giving me Bitcoin. I'll respond to that ping. Sats back, please. Oh, man. All right, so we got any more uh, any more thoughts on Keybase hopefully turning things around? Because I really like them besides the whole Stellar thing. That's it. All righty. Got an old punching bag back in the, in the ring. So Coinbase was granted a patent uh, that was filed March 2015. Um for a system to process Bitcoin transactions based on addresses tied to um, your email. And now I, I, I dug through the, the whole actual patent and tried to figure out whether this is actually completely off chain or not. Um, it's not exactly clear, but I'm gonna give Coinbase the benefit of the doubt that they're not so stupid um, as to 
set this up um, where it's actually moving things on chain. Um, the, the gist is that users are not charged mining fees for everything. Um, they just pay Coinbase a fee. And um, pretty much it's just a mapping system of your email to a Bitcoin address and the ability to process transactions through that um, with a 48 hour um, clearing period before something is actually finalized. Uh, with the goal, according to Brian Armstrong, of making payments easier. And so I think this is really just a piece falling into place, kind of showing th th their whole plan to really just be a Bitcoin PayPal. Um, and it, it's really just like, it's why? Like and and also, like how many different things in in history of this space have tried to tie a Bitcoin address to an email or a social media account or identifier like that? I find it really absurd that the, this idea was not out there as as a prior idea before this this patent was filed. But you know, regardless of that, it's granted now. And yeah, um, it's pretty much just a, a patent on a Bitcoin PayPal. And if I am wrong, and this is actually going to be moving things on chain, um, then I really don't see how this can actually go anywhere at all. Because how how the hell now that we know, you know, we're not getting giga blocks, um, is it going to work where? you pay Coinbase a little fee and don't pay miners fees that they pay to just move things on chain for you by tying an address to your email. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I thought payments weren't going to get easier because of all the enhanced KYC that you'd have to do. So it seems to me that speeding up the payments networks, all that's going to do is create more jobs for uh, the compliance officers, which is why I say you should go really long on compliance officers. Boo. I mean, it's not that the criminality is on the increase. It's not like we, we necessarily have more crime now than we did before KYC and AML controls were in place. It's just that now that we can see more on the network, it's now becoming to light that there's a whole bunch of suspicious activity. It just seems to me that we're pulling in two different directions as an industry. On the one hand, we want more compliance, more surveillance. On the other hand, we want more payments, but it seems that both will just increase one another. Mm, I mean, your, your, your British wit is too sarcastic. <laughs> but, um, it's, you know, it's, it's really like, I, I don't know what the they're going to do with this other than just let this hang and apply to their internal email sends now or try to build this out into the the possible on chain like actually moving things on chain for people which like I just, like if if that was the plan if I, if I'm misreading this this patent and giving the benefit of the doubt to them on that then this is pretty much just a completely retarded dead end idea <clears throat> excuse me from when they they thought we were going to get infinite big giga blocks and uh they they pretty much just got awarded a, a useless patent or wait a minute or did they just get a patent that could be used to sue n chain if bsv tries to do some retarded stuff <gasps> could this be the step down the road to coinbase's redemption is that it guys Oh, man. Insert dramatic music. Note to editor. <laughs> I'm actually going to do that. <laughs> I leave this in as well. <laughs> oh, man. But, yeah, so that's uh, Coinbase is stupid. Tune in next week for the next one. All right, yeah. Good to have that punching bag back. Let's talk a little bit about something that interesting happened. Uh, you know, a little bit of Bitcoin conversation. Caitlin Long took to Twitter this week to let us know that the Federal Reserve's ACH direct deposits were down for a brief time. It started around 3.30 p.m. on Wednesday and was back up the next afternoon. And uh, the, the Fed's ACH stands for Automated Clearinghouse System. And 
yeah, it was down, but it's back up and running now. And John Tate, a spokeswoman for our spokesman for the Atlanta Fed, said, quote, the Fed ACH service, which processes transactions for commercial banks, is currently operating normally after experiencing delays in processing yesterday afternoon and early this morning. Some customers experienced delays in receiving confirmations of yesterday's transactions. Federal Reserve technical staff continue to investigate the root cause of this issue, close quote. And yeah, those uh, customers were uh, rightfully very upset, and they did take to Twitter, uh, you know, going after several different institutions that were supposed to get their direct deposits in that day. Uh, one Twitter user saying, I need my money bills to pay, you know, and uh, one saying, how do you even notify your customers that issues such as direct deposit won't be working? I'm over here pissed because y'all can't get y'all shit together, and someone... Even, you know, the credit unions, they, there's, you know, this ACH goes to all different aspects of different banking. So it went to some credit unions and even uh, Navy Federal and, you know, just anybody that gets this Fed ACH, you know, if you get that direct deposit and it wasn't there on Wednesday evening or Thursday morning, you were out of your paycheck and you had bills to pay. And this caused a big problem. And, uh, yeah, Kaylin, she uh, said, let the memes begin. And, you know, some people did jump on that, and even Zero Hedge was speculating about how this was like, uh, you know, the Fed has plans to enact universal basic income, and this was just a test somehow, but that seems kind of stupid. I mean, uh, if you ask me, I think it's just like a, I don't know, it's just an old network that can run into the same issues as all networks right now, and, you know, it went down for a small period of time, and you're talking about a lot of government employees that get their money through direct deposit. And it just makes me think like, yeah, if uh, if that happens and it doesn't come right back, like talk about pissing off a bunch of people. The average paycheck on the Fed's ACH is around $1,700 to 58 million individuals. So if you could imagine 58 million people at once not getting their paycheck and what kind of thing that could do if you don't get that thing up and running immediately it could cause a lot of problems. I think uh, the laughing man on Twitter had the best uh, meme for this story. It's a uh, quote: "Bitcoin fixes this." China. And how is bit? How is bit? How is Bitcoin affected by this, Rick? Well, its price What's went down because people couldn't get all their their dollars into the exchanges to buy Bitcoin. Right. That's what I was going to say. Is like uh, you know, if people don't have access to their money, then it doesn't just affect Bitcoin. It affects all markets. I mean, even your local grocery store all of a sudden isn't getting the business they were supposed to get because you. you know, the local constituents didn't get their paychecks. So it's like a, uh, it's a trickle down problem that does. Yeah. It includes Bitcoin too. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's really like anybody's guess, uh, what, what the hell caused this, um, China, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it just goes to show with anything, uh, how just little hiccups in something, if it was distributed in a healthy manner, can become catastrophic or incredibly disruptive if you bundle all of that into a central point of failure. Yeah, that's where, yeah, I mean, you know, the speculation, it's kind of jokey, but not really. I mean, yeah, if you want to cause some real pandemonium in this country and our market, I mean, yeah, just shut down that service when... <laughs> Whenever a bunch of people are supposed to be getting their paychecks and just keep it down and what to do. I mean, how exactly are you going to get all that money to all those people? And yeah, it's a, uh, it's just a glaring security hole that is like, we need Bitcoin. This is a problem. It's a big security nightmare. Mm -hmm. Well, any more thoughts? Alrighty then, I guess uh, Janine, uh, you're next up with the last update, and then that's it. Yeah, so this is just going to be another Assange update. I'll try to keep it relatively short because it is, um, in summary, the biggest thing to happen this month is, uh, well, I think it might have actually started in November, I can't precisely remember, but there's been a group of doctors who have been uh, reaching out and advocating for better conditions for Assange in Belmarsh prison because they, like some of them, have actually evaluated him and others have just, uh, you know, heard reports of his condition and such and talked to the other doctors. 
and they all have agreed that uh, it's entirely possible that if his conditions aren't improved, um, we don't know what the length of the extradition hearings will be and what will happen afterwards, but it could easily take several years um, for it to reach any kind of conclusion, which means that he could be in Belmarsh for several years. And they're saying that at, under his current conditions where he's in solitary confinement up to, um, I think it was 21 hours a day, 20, 21 or 23 hours a day, he's basically in isolation. Um, and they say if that doesn't change, he could easily die in prison. Um, the only thing that's happened really in December is that a half hour hearing took place on December 13th with uh, the junior judge again presiding that um, supposedly was replacing the previous one who had a ton of conflicts of interest. Uh, but who knows whether that's going to help anything because that judge is still the um, chief magistrate and this is just a junior judge. but. Uh, Gareth Pierce, who's one of his lawyers, complained that her client has not been able to access materials related to his defense, nor even informed of recently acquired evidence. According to Naomi Colvin, who attended, um, the judge claimed that she had no desire to stand in the way of lawyers having adequate access to their client, but she had no jurisdiction over the prison service. And then at a subsequent hearing on December 19th, just yesterday, um, his other lawyer, Edward Fitzgerald, said that in addition to uh, bringing up the ban on extradition for political offenses, the defense's arguments would feature medical evidence, public denunciations by leading U.S. political figures, details from the case of Chelsea Manning, and information from an investigation led by a Spanish judge into revelations about bugging of conversations with his lawyers. Um, and so Assange was actually supposed to be interviewed today by that Spanish judge. Um, the judge is investigating, is in a criminal investigation of UC Global, which is the company that um, was contracted to provide uh, security, aka surveillance, of the Ecuadorian embassy while Assange was resident there in London. And so he was supposed to be interviewed today, and it was supposed to, I think, have already happened by now. Um, but unfortunately there was, like there often is in this case, there was some kind of mix up apparently. So the live updates that I'm seeing right now is that, um, he has since arrived at the court, but he was very late. And I think it actually, instead of being at the magistrate's court, he actually went to the national court to be interviewed by the Spanish judge, um, in person. I think originally it was actually going to be video link, but apparently now it's going to be in person. Um, so I don't know whether that's concluded yet. When I last checked it, just I was seeing stuff about he hadn't arrived yet and there was some kind of mix up and now he's going to the national court. So hopefully that happens. Um, I, I also did see that he was being quoted saying that he, um, I, I think the interview has started or it might have been commentary from yesterday, but Assange um, stated that he not only was not aware of the extent of the surveillance that was going on in the Ecuadorian embassy, but he certainly did not consent to it. And he actually asked them, you know, is there any audio recording happening? And the, I don't know who he asked, um, whether it was the embassy staff or the actual security team from UC Global, but he asked someone, is there any audio recording? And they said no. And that was clearly a lie because we've seen now a whole bunch of clips of um, him talking to various people in various parts of the embassy and you can hear the conversations because they were audio recorded. So that is the latest uh, update in regards to Assange. Yeah, fuck them. Yeah, it's... Uh... Thanks for keeping us updated on it because, yeah, it's one of those stories that I don't... You know, I just always hope for the best, but there's so much going on. It's hard to keep your eye on everything, and especially the depressing stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess uh, you know, time to slide into final thoughts. So, who wants to go first? I'll take Show it. Show me cause... the daps. Show me no. the daps. <laughs> you got the first final thought, and that's a that's a great yeah. That's that's the pervasive show thought. That's that's where's the daps. But uh, yeah, I've got a couple of final thoughts. Um, 
loaded them in, so maybe we can throw them in the show notes. Uh, the first one is uh, about Michael Krieger. He's at Liberty Blitz on Twitter. Just recently put out a pretty great blog post and uh, called Monetary Looting. And I just wanted to throw that down there so maybe people can grab it, look at it. Here's just a little small clip from it. Quote, the United States has historically bragged about its free and transparent markets, but what the Fed is doing today is pulling a dark curtain around the financing of this so-called free and transparent market. The public has no idea which Wall Street firms have received this $3 trillion or why they can, can't borrow it elsewhere. Close quote. So, yeah, go out there and read that. It's a good blog post, and if you don't follow Liberty Blitz, you might want to. He's a great guy. Uh, always has some good commentary on the news. And also uh, just wanted to give a uh, shout-out back to Hodlnot for being one of the Coindesk most influential this year. And, uh, you know, Coindesk actually stepping up on the most influential list, talking about the most influential archetype in Bitcoin is Will Shinobi, the pseudo-anonymous man. So, yeah, congratulations to all pseudo-anonymous entities out there, including yourself and Janine. And, yeah, it's... Uh, and hot or not, I know you're still out there rocking it. We're all still hot or not. So, yeah, those are the couple final thoughts. They finally got something right. Ah, so, Janine, what's up? Um, my final thought is I've, I've recommended it a few times, but there's been a new chapter of Fisheye Placebo released in the last week. Um, so, check that out. Uh, it's really awesome. I need to find time to read that. <sighs> but yeah, I guess uh, I don't really have any uh, today. Uh, so I guess until next episode, toodaloo, punks. Hold up. Hold up. Uh, happy holidays, maybe. I don't know. I mean, it'll be the holidays ha over. So no. no. Merry no. Christmas. No. 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 Happy hodl days. Oh, that's what's up. There's a good final thought. Happy hodl days, everybody. Yeah, uh, we'll see about that. Later, punks. Later. Bye. Peace. <laughs>